Right, going back briefly in history, just the last three years. Um, 2012, uh, Professor John Nolan, his main theme was education. YK Cheng, uh, 2013, main theme international context, international affairs, the importance of being within the international community. And of course, Nick, last year, we've just heard from Ian, Nick's main theme last year was member benefits. But the reality is that actually all the presidents have this ongoing theme. And this is why I would really like to thank Nick. Um, because what Nick has done is he has aligned us as presidents. This was very much his initiative in consultation with Martin, the CEO, to align us all and to have these, these ongoing themes where it wasn't a set of silo presidential ideas, but you had this ongoing stream. And that's exactly what I intend to do this year. By the end of this presentation, you'll understand that I'm very much into education. But I hope that you'll also see that international and member benefits are very much part of what I'm about. So, as is normal in these presentations, that's me from a few years ago. <laughs> but that's where I grew up. So I grew up in Cape Town. It's a fabulous city. Fantastic city in which to grow up. Great place. And the centre image at the top that is of the suburb in which I grew up, and I've got lots of people in the audience, uh, friends and family who grew up in, in Cape Town too, in the same suburb. So that's Constantia. It's where the original grapes were grown in the 17th century for the vineyards. A nice place to grow up. Uh, went to a school called Bishops uh, on the top right. Uh, fabulous school. My brother Chris went to Bishops as well. And then on to the University of Cape Town, bottom left. Uh, with Bridget, my sister, and Chris and myself, we went, that's where we went. It's a top 100 university in the world, fa fabulous place, amazing geography, and just wonderful, wonderful academics. Uh, it really did set my career up. And the image in the bottom right, it's slightly, slightly rose-tinted glasses, but that is more or less what our childhood was like. That was, that was a, that's me standing in the pool next to my brother Chris, and that was what it was like, that's our, that was our childhood. But in life, as we're all acutely aware, there is always a but. And bear in mind now, this was South Africa. It's the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, so you know what's coming. It was apartheid. It's undoubtedly, of course, the most evil period in South African history, and one of the most evil periods, of course, in world history. Um, and it's difficult to describe to you now what it felt to the three of us growing up that there was going to be a civil war. It was just a question of when, and everything was going to be a complete disaster. And it's difficult to say that now without thinking that we just thought that. It was so real. It was going to happen. Um, and that it didn't happen is just pure miracle. And that's just down to Nelson Mandela. It's quite simple. Uh, so it was a pure miracle that it didn't happen, but it was going to happen. That was our thought process. So all of us had to get out of the country. That was what we had to do. So Chris and Bridget got out in different ways. My route of escape was study. And the University of Cape Town were fantastic to me. They gave me a full scholarship to study at the University of Cambridge, which is where I ended up doing a PhD in pre-stress concrete. So the image on the right I am particularly proud of. Uh, <laughs> that is me sitting at the front of a concrete punt. And the person uh, who's rowing at the back is TK Chan. The two of us were PhD students together. Uh, Jay Kwong somewhere in the audience. Jay was a PhD student at the time. Cam, there are all kinds of people in the audience. Janet in the audience who were PhD students at the time. And we made that punt. And uh, I was incredibly proud. We drew a little line around the outside of the punt and said, I wonder if the water level will be right. And it was perfect. And we thought, this was, this was wonderful. The mathematics worked. Um, and in the background, there's a person standing second from the left. That is Ahmed El Sheikh. Um, I should have said Chan is a professor at the University of Melbourne now. Um, Ahmed El Sheikh at the back, second from left. He is Dean of Engineering at the University of Liverpool. So I was surrounded by very special people. And, and I have no doubt at all that, uh, that the, the, the PhD students going through that structures group still today are very special people. But there are three special academics at that institution, University of Cambridge, which deserve, absolutely deserve certain comments. Uh, the three Chrises. So from left to right, Chris Morley, Chris Burgoyne, Chris Calladine. Chris Burgoyne in the middle. Chris, are you here? I haven't seen you this evening. No, he's not. He said he would be here. He said he would break a habit of a lifetime and come to the first inaugural ever. <laughs> um, he lied. <laughs> uh, 
so Chris, Chris was my PhD supervisor. It's Chris Burgoyne in the middle. They're all Chris. Chris Burgoyne in the middle was my PhD supervisor. And if I learned nothing else in Cambridge, and I learned an awful lot, if I learned nothing else, it was, if you want to be a structural engineer, you better understand the load bound theorem. And if you don't understand it, do not call yourself a structural engineer. And that has stuck in my mind. And so there are people in this room who I have taught and who I teach now. And you, I, I'm looking at some, you're smiling, which is good, because that's where it came from. It came from those Chris's. At the end of 1992, I finished my PhD. Um, and South Africa had dramatically changed. And I had to go back to South Africa, morally and contractually, because a, a vast petrochemical company called Sassel, which is showing one of their plants there, um, had sponsored me all the way through my undergraduate, my master's, and my PhD. And they were fabulous to me, absolutely fabulous. They sponsored a lot. Um, and so I owed them work. But it wasn't just that. I owed them morally, clearly. And I went back to an entirely different country. It was just, I can't describe to you, going back to live in a country which three years before you had been seen as being a scab to be part of that country. You know, holding your passport, South African passport, it wasn't fun. And all of a sudden, it was pr I was proud to be South African. I, the, the transformation was just extraordinary. Um, so I went back, and I worked for Sasso, and it was a fantastic job. This was in a little town called Secunda, between Johannesburg and the Kruger National Park. So if you know your geography of South Africa, you'll know what I mean. Um, but it was in the desert. So the job itself was spectacular. You can imagine, as a structural engineer, you've got all the materials which you would use in construction. You've got enormous towers, everything's shaking around, so your dynamics needs to be pretty good. You've got crises going on, you've got chemical spillage, you've got all kinds of things, and building new plants within the plant. It was a fabulous job, absolutely fabulous. <laughs> but it was Secunda. It was, and if anybody's listening when they live in Secunda, then I do apologize. <laughs> but I had grown up in Cape Town, and I, which is a tourist city. I'd then gone to Cambridge, a very tourist city, and now I was living in the desert, and it didn't really appeal as much to me. <laughs> and so again, I had to get out. And I got a phone call one evening from Cam, Cam Middleton. He rang me up, and he said, uh, Tim, I've, got a, I've just been given funding from the Highways Agency and from EPSRC. Uh, to look at the strength of our concrete bridges. Would you like to be the researcher? So I said, yes, please. So I spent the next three and a half years in Cambridge doing a postdoc with Cam and with Chris Morley, uh, looking at how bridges might collapse very brittly if they ever were to collapse. So instead of nice, soft, bending failure, which, which is what Cam had been working on fantastically, it produced a wonderful uh, tool which is, still which is used profoundly across the profession to determine the bending capacity of bridges. Actually, now what we needed was a tool which looked at the shear capacity of bridges, the, the bit of bridges where if it were ever to fail, it failed suddenly. That's, that's the bit which now needed to be done. Anyway, it was a fabulous time. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I'm, I forgot to mention Gopes. Gopes, I know you're in the audience. Uh, because we used to play cricket. And next year's president, Alan, um, He's, he's, a, he's an accomplished cricket umpire, so we talk about cricket all the time. If there's one bit of Cambridge that I miss dramatically, it's playing cricket. It was a fabulous time um, when, during all those years. But the postdoc came to an end, and the University of Bath was advertising for a lectureship, and I was now completely hooked on research and on teaching. I desperately wanted to teach. Doing a postdoc wasn't good enough. I wanted to do some teaching as well. Um, and Thankfully, the University of Bath was advertising, and they were advertising in the Department of Architecture and Civil Engineering. And, and I remember reading the advert thinking, and just the top line saying, it's a Department of Architecture and Civil Engineering. If architects and engineers are going to work together, then they should be educated together. And I remember just thinking, I want to work there. That just sounds absolutely fabulous. Um, so luckily enough, I got the job. Those of you in the, in the, um, in the audience, if you've, if you've never been to Bath, then go. It's a great place for a visit. This is the centre of Bath, the Roman Bath in the, in the centre. It's about, as you would imagine, about 2,000 years old. And then it's surrounded by Georgian Bath, which is 200 to 250 years old, that, that ballpark. And, and collectively, it is a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's a fabulous place in which to live, absolutely wonderful. But actually, it's an equally nice place to work. So that's the University of Bath, which is where I work, which is on top of the hill. And I have colleagues in the room. Thank you very much for being here from the University of Bath. 
great to see you. Um, and you will agree with me that it is such a nice place to work. And what you see is what you get. We are surrounded by an area of outstanding natural beauty, and it just makes life fun. And, uh, and work, work is a real pleasure. But of course, work isn't just work. work life isn't about work. So I um, met Jackie uh, many years ago, and we had James. And unfortunately, James is not here tonight because he's got a terrible temperature. So he's at home, uh, unfortunately, because he would have liked the next slide, which I, I won't. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so my life changed dramatically, wonderfully, of course, brilliantly for the better. Um, and what's really important, I'm going to come on to the importance in a second of having enthusiasm from students and engendering enthusiasm in students. That's, I'm coming to that later. But it's nice to see that when you start talking about you know, the, the essential things to teach, a, to teach a kid, you know, unsaturated soil mechanics, this is really important <laughs> to, to, to teach. And to see the enthusiasm, it's just fantastic. <laughs> so this is, all, this is all good stuff, and I really do hope he watches this webinar. He wouldn't have been expecting that. But life is about people. And uh, Mike Barnes is in the audience, and I need to pay tribute to Mike. Mike is sitting on the left-hand side um, with a white shirt on. This was taken at Mike's retirement party in 2004. Quite straightforwardly, Mike is undoubtedly the most extraordinary academic I have ever had the real privilege and pleasure of working with. Absolutely fabulous. Um, Mike's uh, research background, simply second to none worldwide. Anybody in the room who's ever done anything associated with tensile structures, you have done that work based largely on Mike's research. That's, that's just a fact. Um, but it, it wasn't the research, frankly, which did it for me. That was wonderful, but it was the teaching. I arrived in Bath, and I used to sit in design studios with, with students in little groups. And Mike would sit next to me, and I'd sit over here, and I'd be talking, and I'd, I'd be watching what Mike was doing. And he'd take out his sketchbook, and he'd start sketching connections. And I never really got it. And suddenly, one day, it just clicked. And I realized that why are these students students? They're students because when they were seven, eight, nine, ten years old, they used to put things together, they used to make things. And therefore, connections is where the inspiration lies. So it just, I hadn't really ever thought about that before. I should have, but I didn't. And it was watching Mike sketching connection details and then talking to students about how they might approximate their structures. And I had this conversation last night with John Nolan, wherever you are in the room, John, there you are. Um, and a, a approximation of structures is just everything. It's so much more important than the so-called real thing. And Mike taught me that. Uh, without that, that mentoring, I just, well, without your mentoring, Mike, I wouldn't be standing here. It's, uh, it's pretty simple. So that was very special. And we were talking about mentoring at the council meeting this afternoon. And it just resonated with me so much. Strong, proper, wonderful mentoring can make careers. So all the time since uh, when, I, from a, when I arrived at, at uh, Bath University, uh, right from the start, my research was in using carbon fiber reinforced polymer materials to strengthen and prolong the life of our concrete infrastructure. That was what... That was what I um, was working on. And I got that inspiration from talking to Chris Burgoyne, who uh, one of his research areas was this sort of area. Uh, so right from the start, this is what we did. And I know that Monica, one of my PhD students, is in the room. And she's um, a recent PhD student working in this, this sort of area, relating to the top left photograph, in fact. But as you can see from these photographs, these are, these are big structures. And I don't believe in testing small structures. It's just not part of my psyche because we just know that there are size effects, that small structures don't behave the same way as big structures. So that means it's a bit more trouble for us, because we have to go begging for money to do all of this kind of stuff. But we get the money, and we do the work. And then it's got real impact. And that's when the design, the design guides, which we write in our team, so Anthony Darby in the room, and John O, I know, is here, and Mark Evenden, as a team, we do all this sort of work. And it's important, and it's, it is appreciated. So this is... This is ongoing work, which we continue to do. And it's good fun. But actually, better fun. Monica, forgive me, but I need to say this. Better fun is, uh, is the work which I'm about to describe. Um, I love this bit. Just imagine any concrete structure being built anywhere in the world. Okay? We know through research that for every cubic meter of concrete which goes into that structure, unfortunately, only 40% of it actually does anything for us. The other 60% does nothing for us. 
And the easiest way to describe it is if you look at that concrete structure which is shown there, the, the concrete, the, the, the horizontal the, um, uh, floor plates, it's the same amount of concrete everywhere, but common sense tells you that the stresses must vary, surely, across that slab. And therefore, if stresses are low, then why do you have the same amount of concrete in those positions? So we're wasting concrete. But we, we kind of know we are. But, and people might say, well, so what? It's <coughs> easier to build like that. Well, I disagree. I think that we should put material where we need it, and we must remember that concrete's a fluid. Those two, those two lessons need to be put together, and we need to remember that. Why do we always take this beautiful wet concrete and put it into rectangular molds? Why? Why don't we remember that actually we can mold it into any shape that we like? So let's look at this. This is an example, for instance. This is a concrete beam, but just imagine, just imagine for a second that it was a bookshelf and you had bought it from a DIY store. So you go to a DIY store and you buy this concrete beam to use as a bookshelf. Just imagine, right? And you bring it back home and let's say it's that long and you, you <coughs> want to put it up on the wall. So it's that long, so where do you put the supports? Well, you don't put them at the end. Nobody would ever do that. That would be daft. You put them slightly in from the end. That's natural, okay? So that's what we do. So you put your supports there. And the structural engineers in the room you will all agree that that actually is a really, really rather sensible shape for the beam if it is loaded all the way across its top, uniformly. That is a sensible shape. <coughs> you need lots of material over the two supports because the stresses will be high, and you need lots of material in the middle because the stresses will be high, but everywhere else you don't. So why do we always have a rectangular beam which has the same amount of concrete everywhere? We should be building like that. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we take fabric, Instead of using a rigid form, we use fabric, and we cast wet concrete into fabric, and we allow the fabric to stretch. And what we can do is, by stretching the fabric ourselves, or loosening it, and perhaps in the third direction, loosening it or stretching it, we can play with the shapes of our concrete. And the, what I'm going to say next is, is very techy point. So it's for the structural engineers in the room, so forgive me, but I'll make one little techy point, which is, what is a bending moment diagram? A bending moment diagram is a line of tension. It's all it is. So if we have fabric which stretches when we put concrete into it, it stretches into a shape. It's a line of tension. So by definition, the shape that we are producing is the appropriate shape. It covers the many moment diagram. It's, it seems perfectly logical. And that's what we do. So this is how we play. This is, this is how we spend our days. And I love this image. That is formwork. Not those great big yellow steel forms that you see all over construction sites. That's formwork. And this image is courtesy of Professor Mark West. He is uh, an architect in Canada. He's actually just left, just very recently left the University of Manitoba. But we collaborate with him a lot. Um, so our team, so Anthony, Mark, and John, and myself, we collaborate with Mark an awful lot in this sort of field. And I just think that that image just sums it up beautifully, that that's what we're talking about. So this is where Mark started many years ago. He started by, by taking some fabric and pouring some concrete into it. And you end up with a shape like that, which is mildly interesting. It's a bit more interesting than a rectangle. Yeah, big deal. Not, not too interesting. But actually, quickly evolved into something like that. So how did Mark do this? What he did was he, he had fabric um, into which he poured the concrete. And before he poured the concrete, he would take the fabric and bunch it along its length and then pour the concrete so that it flowed inside the fabric and then rip the fabric off and the concrete was hard. And that's what you see, that's what you get. So there's an architectural interest about it. Actually, structurally, it's rather sensible because you don't need too much concrete material in the middle. That's not where the stresses are high. So you don't need that material in the middle. And I need to point out that you're looking at concrete then. That is concrete. That is not <coughs> fabric. So we rip the concrete off when we do our tests in the lab, uh, when we do these sorts of uh, tests in our lab. And the first thing that anybody ever does is they walk up and they feel the concrete. And apart from Martin, I had to do this, apart from Martin and myself, who are the only two saddos in the room who actually normally do feel concrete structures, <laughs> nobody else in their right mind would ever walk up to a concrete structure and feel it, right? But you do with this. Everybody does with fabric form or concrete because it looks like fabric. It's just, it's wonderful stuff. So it is, there is a texture about it which is really rather compelling. How do we make columns? We take fabric and we drape the fabric and we clamp the fabric and then we pour concrete in. And what's profound, there's something profound about this one too, uh, that the profoundness of the beams lies in the bending moment diagram. I think the profoundness of columns 
lies in the fact that when we pour the wet concrete into, these, into this fabric form, it fills up this tube and it pushes outwards under hydrostatic force onto the fabric. And therefore, it creates the shape that we want because it stretches the fabric a bit, which creates the shape. Otherwise, the fabric would be floppy, but it creates that circular shape. In other words, we are using the forces of nature to give us the shape we want. And compare that with a rectangular, heavy steel mold, where while the concrete's hardening, we are fighting against the forces of nature to ensure that the concrete stays in the shape that we want. So we are fighting there, and here we are relying on the forces of nature to give us the shapes that we want. So that's lesson over. Um, the, the, the right hand image is the, um, is the final column that we might get from this. That's really rather simple, but you can of course extend that. So you can create Y-shaped columns, which are really rather beautiful, and which rely on using one piece of fabric to make them. And you either allow the fabric to stretch a bit, or you take a little bit of fabric in, and you can create any shapes that you like. Imagine doing that with a CNC cutting machine to create the, the, the shapes that you want. And that's with one piece of fabric. And that, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a real advantage there. And finally, in this, in this area, um, this, I love this image. Uh, this is an image of, of a, what we would call a T-beam, uh, which, which we would cast in a, in a factory, perhaps, pick up and take onto site. And you would see in any, in any building, not, not any building, but buildings which are where you would see rectangular beams, just imagine a rectangular beam, just imagine a cut either side in the slab, and you, you would see some slab on top and a rectangular beam in the middle. So we call it a T-beam. Well, that's what that is. And it tapers towards the end because we've cast it using a piece of fabric, which is nice because we wait, we, we're saving on material and it looks beautiful. But that's not the reason why I'm showing the image. The reason I'm showing the image is because of these little <coughs> ribs, the ribs that you can see along the length. And there's something to me, and this is, this is one piece of fabric making this beam, and we can just play and we can get those sorts of shapes relatively easily. And what I like about this is the fact that it's, to me it's intuitive that if you have a T-beam, a rectangular T-beam, it feels right to me, if you have a rectangular T-beam with some slab on top and you load it, that you would have ribs along the length. If I was seven years old, I would think that that was intuitively obvious. Your spine does that. Why don't our structures do that? And you can do that. You, we can do that with one piece of fabric. And we can play, and we can do different sorts of things. So I hope you begin to see that. I really like this field. This is, this is good stuff for me. And, I, this, and there are all kinds of structural engineering questions which we need to answer, which I won't go into the details now. But that gives you a flavor for the sorts of things that we get up to in, in our research. I've spoken a lot so far, probably too much, about myself and the research which we do. Um, and now it's time for me to get on to the point, which is, which is what my theme is. Um, and it's to do with education. So there is a wonderful acronym in the UK, which is STEM. And STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics. That's what it stands for. And there isn't an engineering profession, but a professional body or a science-based professional body in the UK who would not buy into the STEM initiatives. And those STEM initiatives are to encourage people like us in this room to go out into schools and to tell school kids about the importance of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to the future of the UK and how exciting it can be to use these subjects as the basis for wonderful science and wonderful engineering. And they are fabulous schemes, and we support them wholeheartedly. I think they could be tweaked, and I'm not the first person to say this by any means, but I think that that word can be tweaked, and I think we need to add an A. I think we should be talking about STEAM. And the A is for art, and I am absolutely convinced that STEM isn't good enough for structural engineering. STEAM is what we really require, and I'm going to explain why I believe that. Here is a quote, and it's a, it's a made-up quote. I made this up myself, but it's a sort of quote. <laughs> it's, it's the sort of quote which you will get from a 17-year-old, okay, who wants to study civil and structural engineering, and the academics in the room, you will be perfectly used to reading this sort of statement at the top of any application to study civil and structural engineering at university. So I'll read it out. I want to study civil structural engineering because I'm fascinated by great buildings and structures such as the Burj, the, Ger Burj, the Gherkin, Gateshead, Winking Eye Bridge, and Meow Viaduct. I want to design these sorts of structures. Fantastic. Just the sort of thing we want to read. Enthusiasm, go get 
fantastic, I want to change the world. We love reading things like that. <laughs> student gets their A's and get their A stars, and they get into university. <laughs> Fabulous. And they're full of beans, and they want to do, thing, do something. What I'm about to show, the image I'm about to show is slightly unfair. But I am going to go absolutely no further than saying that it is slightly unfair. Yeah, that's all I believe it to be, because sometimes you will see a third or fourth year design project will produce that. And I look at that and I say to myself, where on earth did it all go wrong? Where has the creativity and how has the creativity been sucked out of that student that when they were 17 they wanted to change the world and now they want to produce that? I'm not suggesting for a second that a structure like that is irrelevant. I'm not. Please don't get me wrong. In terms of the short amount of time that we have with our students, I do believe that that's wrong. I really do, because we need to, our, our job is to inspire, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. Right, this is all related. This is not a change in tack. Look at the board over on my right. This is a, a, a new uh, addition within the building, which I think is fabulous. Look at those names, particularly the structural engineers in the room. The gold medalists of our institution represent something really special. So what is it? That's 100 years of just the greatest structural engineers the world has known. That's what that list represents. Why aren't all of us on that board? Okay. There's a big difference between them and the rest of us. And what is it? Is it STEM? Uh, maybe. They're going to be very, very good at STEM. There's no question in my mind they will be fantastically good at STEM when they were at school, I have no doubt. Is it structural mechanics? Well, yeah, probably. They're, they're, they're good. They would obviously be superb at superb structural mechanics, but actually so is everybody else in this room who is a member of this institution. Everybody has demonstrated through enormously long examination processes that actually structural mechanics is pretty good, pretty good in this, in this institution. In fact, it's damn good in this institution. So that's, that's not the answer. The answer is creativity. That is why those people on the board are on the board, and we have one or two of them in the audience tonight, and why the rest of us are not. It's the word creativity. That's what it is. And if that is the case, where on earth is creativity in our undergraduate curricula? And what I mean by that question is, which of our universities explicitly has as a learning outcome creativity? Which of them does? We've just proved, I think I've proved, I hope, that creativity is the soul of our profession. There you are. This is the great and the good, and the difference is creativity. Well, where is it in the way that we teach? And where is it explicitly stated that that is what and how we should be teaching? So, all the way through my undergraduate degree program, right from, the, the, from day one to final year, I wanted to know how an egg worked. I was desperate to know how an egg worked. David Attenborough <coughs> kept telling me how fantastic an egg was. <laughs> Newsreaders did, next door neighbors, everybody, everybody in this room, at some point in your life, Many times, probably, you've all been told how wonderful an egg is. I know I'm right. You've all been told that, and we all know that, don't we? So as a structural engineering student, why wasn't I being taught how an egg worked? It doesn't make any sense. And where were the egg-shaped buildings all around me? Why was everything vertical and horizontal? Why weren't we using eggs? Because everybody kept telling us how wonderful an egg was. Of course, there are some egg-shaped structures. I'm, I, but I, we need to be using this. We need to be using this in education of our students. I'm completely convinced of this. At, so I have wonderful colleagues. So at the University of Bath, got fantastic colleagues. Uh, that some of these projects here have, uh, have had design input, certainly from Professor Richard Harris, who I think might be in the audience this evening. Um, and where we, where we are really very keen to relate geometric form with material. Because we believe that if you have geometric form material, you have the basis of creativity. That's, that's, that's the belief. That's, that's where we are coming from in this. So let me give you a very simple story, which I, which I hope tries to illustrate this. Just imagine a tree in a forest. A great, great big tree, and you decide that you want to use that tree for timber in construction. Okay? So the timber from that tree will come from the trunk of the tree. So you don't have to worry about the branches or anything like that. It will come from the trunk. So that tree sits in the forest, and of course the tree is incredibly heavy, so it weighs down on that trunk. All of that, all the life of that tree, that trunk will be compressed. 
and then every now and then the wind will blow it. So that trunk of the tree every now and then will bend. Which means that if you take the timber out of the trunk and you take it and you put it into a structure, wouldn't you be daft if you did anything other than to ensure that that timber was being compressed and every now and then it bent? Because that's what a tree is. Therefore, that's how we should be using timber. And if you put those two ideas together, you get timber grid shells. It becomes a self-fulfilling, obvious prophecy. And that's connecting the geometry with the form, with the material in a way which I think is rather, rather simple, actually. There's nothing profound in what I just said at all. It's rather simple. And I think you can tell that sort of story about any of the construction materials we use, where you have appropriate form with appropriate material use. And there's, there's the proof of that. All kinds of different materials which we can use appropriately where geometry and materials uh, fit together very nicely. So, how do we embed this? How do we put this into, into undergraduate curricula? I am in, I'm an unbelievably <coughs> opinionated person, so forgive me. But, but I do believe quite strongly that design projects throughout a design curriculum, throughout an undergraduate curriculum, is the answer. That's, that's what I firmly believe. Every civil engineering degree program across the world will have at least two, three, maybe even four design projects embedded in, in them throughout the, the four or five years of, of study. That's perfectly normal. I'm not talking that number. I'm talking about design projects which start on day one of first year, never stop until the final day of final year. That's what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about architectural education. That's actually what I'm talking about. We have got so much to learn from our architecture colleagues in the way in which those students are taught. They rely heavily on projects. So, from that perspective, I believe that design projects need to be embedded throughout our degree programs, and they need to be holistic, absolutely essential. In our profession, we have got to cover, surely, architecture, structure, building physics, and materials. We've got to cover them all. How, how would it be possible, as part of education, to give a student something and we say, oh, don't worry about this aspect, or don't worry about that? It makes no sense to me. What does make some sense to me is saying, well, in this particular project, we're going to play a bit more heavily on this area than on the other areas. And, and I get that, and I'm, I'm relatively happy with that. But to have projects which are not holistic in nature doesn't make, to me, any sense at all. They need to be inspirational and open-ended. I think that's fairly obvious. And they need to have precedence. I, I'm a firm believer that uh, our civil engineering students do not study enough precedent. So they will study, in almost all universities, you will study, uh, you will study past failure. And that's incredibly important. I, and I'm, I think it's tremendously important that we understand what mistakes never to make again. But I do believe that we should spend at least the same amount of time on teaching success. The things that the profession has done quite brilliantly. And we need to learn from that. Architects probably spend too much time on precedent, and I think I have the moral high ground to say that, coming from a joint department of architecture and civil engineering. So I think they probably spend too much time on precedent, but the civil engineers certainly, in my opinion, do not spend enough time. And the proof is there right in front of us. If you walk up to any architecture student and you say, come on, name 10 living architects, they will give you 25 names before you can say Renzo Piera. It's just instant. They will just give you the names. And if you walk up to a civil engineering student or a civil structural engineering student and say, name me 10 living structural engineers, you have no chance, no chance at all. And this has got nothing to do with hero worship, nothing at all. It's got to do with understanding the modern profession and what it's doing and the success which is going on in the profession right now and treating that as the inspiration for education. I believe that um, design projects need to be stretching. And they must never apply the known. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is we will often have um, uh, a situation where somebody will teach maybe for seven or eight weeks some, some aspect of structural engineering and then say, well, now we'll have a design project at the end which applies the knowledge that you've just, you've just learned. I think, I think at best that's missing a trick and I think at worst that's, that's just not good enough, frankly. Isn't it surely much better to take that design project and put it right at the start of the process so that students, they can have their ideas and they can test their ideas and they can discard their ideas because they will realize quickly that some of their ideas are just completely daft. But they will learn that themselves. Nobody else has told them that. They've discovered that for themselves. And they will discover what it is that they don't know. 
And discovering what it is that you don't know is education. That's all it is, in my opinion. So, when, you've, when you know what you don't know, you are motivated to learn it, because you realize the importance of it. And therefore, having that inspirational design project at the start of the process makes a huge difference, because it means that when you then teach the stuff afterwards, students are incredibly attentive, because they understand exactly how important it is. I do think that the last point here is probably the most important point that I want to make on this slide. Every one of us in this room has learned absolutely everything through making mistakes. It's how all of us have learned absolutely everything. Our entire informal education is based on making mistakes. So why don't we then take that informal education of making mistakes and implant it into our formal education? Well, we don't do that. Our formal education says it's really bad to make a mistake. If you make a mistake, we'll penalize you. We'll drop your degree classification. That's not good. And we will keep assessing you all the time. And we will continue to assess you all the time. And if you keep making mistakes, we'll keep penalizing you. That's not learning. It's impossible. Our own experience in informal education tells us that that is completely impossible. And we have living proof in front of us that we overassess. Just, you just have to look at Finland as a country. Finland, they never assess any of their school children until they leave school. And that's fine. At the end, when you assess what somebody has finally learned, that's when they assess. There's a wonderful comment which a colleague of mine, Alex Wright, who's head of architecture at Bath, um, when I was sort of chewing the cub with him about this talk, he said to me, he said, yeah, you're quite right. He said, you, 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 know, you, can't, you, you don't fatten a pig uh, by weighing it. And of course you don't. You, you, you simply, it's a fantastic comment. You, <laughs> you simply don't. You, and in Finland, they don't assess until right at the end. And funnily enough, Finland is always top of the league tables in everything. And we all know that. They always come top in everything. There's a lesson there. I'm convinced there's a lesson there. We must allow mistake making. So the image at the bottom of this, of this uh, slide is of a des design studio atmosphere where students can get together and they can talk to each other. They can make models. They can sketch. They can put music on. They can make coffee. They can, there's an environment in which it's okay to make mistakes. It's fine. You can learn from your peers. You can learn from academics. You can learn from industrials coming in, designers. And it's okay to make mistakes. And that atmosphere is critical, I believe, in producing the images at the top of this slide, which I would simply hope you would believe are more interesting than the sorts of images we saw earlier in terms of that shed, which I showed earlier. And if you look at those images at the top as student <coughs> output, where the architecture is involved and the materiality and the building physics and the structure, of course, it is, there's a profound difference. And the profound difference comes from having that inspirational environment. I'm, I'm in entirely convinced of that. And it's not just the word inspirational. That's too easy to say that. It's an environment which allows stu students to make mistakes. So I said it earlier. And this is now a repeat. <coughs> an academic's job is to inspire. I look at myself uh, as being paid a salary to inspire. That's all I get paid my salary to do. That's the way that I look at my job. And I see a lot of people who will say to a 17-year-old coming into, wanting to study civil engineering or structural engineering, saying, look, come and study with us. In other words, they're selling their degree. Come and study with us. And if at the end of the degree you don't like civil engineering, that's fine. You can do all kinds of other things. You can become a banker or you can become whatever you want to become. <coughs> we need to ban that from being said to a 17-year-old in order to sell degrees. We've got to stop that. We have to stop those comments being made. We must stop them. It's not right. Because we're taking on <coughs> students which, who, who, by definition, some of those students will not be motivated. And I hope that if I've done nothing else, I've demonstrated that there is a very profound link between being motivated and learning. And if we break that link, our education is, is going to suffer. There's no question at all. And we need that creativity because it leads all our learning. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I do need to clarify one point, because there will be some people in the room <laughs> thinking this. If a final year student comes to me, and this happens from time to time, and they walk in my room and they say, look, Tim, I know that you love structural engineering, but I don't. And I've been through your degree program, and I struggled, and I don't want to be a civil engineer or structural engineer or any engineer. I want to do something else. And I will sit down and spend hours with that student at that point. That's absolutely appropriate. And there are all kinds of things that you can do with these degree programs. But 
don't tell a 17-year-old that in order to sell the degree program to them. So creativity, I hope I've demonstrated, is the bedrock of education, in, in certainly in structural engineering. And I do also believe that it should be seen to be the bedrock link from student membership of this institution to graduate mem membership of this institution. It seems to me an obvious leap. We need our students to understand that we represent in this institution creativity. It's there on the board. That's the, that is the soul of the profession. And that's what we need to demonstrate. I think it's crucial. We also need to demonstrate, and this is a slight change now, we also need to demonstrate that creativity leads education and mistake making leads education. And we need both. And I believe that universities and the institution needs to, need to play to both. I think it's harder for universities to play to the mistake making. It's a harder process. We will continue to assess, I have no, no doubt about it. It's not going to happen overnight that we have a massively reduced assessment regime. I'm looking at the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Bath at this minute. Um, it's unlikely that we are going to do that. Therefore, it's incumbent on this institution to do that. And I am therefore desperately proud that I was part of this project, the Structural Behaviour Examination, which is about to launch, which allows our members to make mistakes. Because if we've got the creativity for the education and we've got the making mistakes for education, we've got a profound <coughs> educational system, which this institution represents. So there is a database which exists. There, there are over 200 questions. And a student or a graduate or any member of the institution can log on at any point and download a little randomly generated test. I should say we'll be able to when it's launched soon. Um, and they can, they can take this test. And it's a multiple choice test. If they get an answer right, fantastic. If they get an answer wrong, then so what? They've learned. It will be a little message will come up saying why they're wrong. And, and it will be a feedback, an instant feedback. They'll be doing it at 2 o'clock in the morning in their, wherever they live, and there will be nobody standing behind them saying, you got that wrong, you fool. There'll be nobody like that doing that. They will learn in a very supportive atmosphere, and that will lead to deep learning. I've no doubt about it. So here we are. This is one example from our database of questions, which we're about to launch. And it's a roof truss. So I've chosen something which I know that everyone in the room will be perfectly used to seeing. A roof truss, this is the, the image at the top, and there are four possible answers. And I'll come to the question in a second. And the roof truss sits being supported each end, and it's got three blue arrows on it. And those arrows are the weight of things acting on top. So it could be the weight of the tiles, snow, people walking on it, you name it. OK. Now. The question is, of all the members inside that truss, which of those members are intention? And if they're, in, in other words, they're being stretched. And if they're intention, then we, we put a capital T next to them. And which of those members are in compression? And if they're in compression, we put a capital C. And which of those members possibly don't carry any load at all? Okay, so that's, that's the question. I will, I will tell you immediately, the instruction engineers in the room, I know you would have all gone straight to the correct answer. I'm fully aware of that. But the correct answer is top left-hand corner. That's the correct answer. And there are a few things, that points, a few points I want to make. I haven't told you the size of the loads. I haven't told you the geometry. I haven't told you anything. All I've given you is a sketch of something. And yet, it is possible as a structural engineer to look and say, right, the correct answer is top left, with no numbers, no maths, none of that. Structural understanding, real, profound understanding of how structure works. And there are a couple of things there. I've purposely chosen this, this example to say the following, which is there might be a couple of things there which are slightly intuitively not obvious. So you've got these four, these four members coming to the top, this apex at the top of, the, of this truss. And you might have thought, if you've got a great big load on top, that all four of those members should be pushing that load back up. And that's not the case. Only two of them are, the two outside ones, but the two in the middle actually have to act in tension. They've got to pull that apex down. And if you're not a structural engineer and you're confused, that's fine, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, but I hope that that's one simple example. Another simple example is the, ver the two vertical members underneath the two side uh, loads acting down. You might think that because the load acts directly into them, that they must be being compressed. Well, no, they don't. They don't carry any load at all. That's zero. And there's a very good reason for that. So structural engineering sometimes actually is rather complex. Usually, frankly, it's quite intuitive. Sometimes it's complex. And the students, everybody has to understand the difference and when the difference will occur. 
And it takes a long time. It takes a long time to get these structural concepts into a student's head. And this helps tremendously in making mistakes to allow students to really click all of a sudden when they see the wrong answer or the right answer. So how else should we enthuse our student members to become graduate members? I've talked about the creativity. I've talked about the making mistakes, which collectively, to me, mean education. We talked actually today in, in our council meeting about some of these issues by chance. So this is good to see that there's a, there's a corroboration with some of the things which I would said in advance. We do need a, so a social media platform, I believe, where students and graduates can get together and talk about career aspirations. I think that's crucial. I also think we should be telling our final year students about the benefits of graduate membership. I think we tell our students wonderfully about the benefits of student membership and wonderfully about the benefits of professional qualification, in other words, chartership or incorporated engineer status. And I do think that we neglect somewhat the middle bit, the, the real benefits of being a graduate member of this institution. And I think we, we, we can do better there. We need to help our student liaison officers. Our student liaison officers are academics and universities who are the link between our student membership, which is about 7,000. It's a sizable number of, of uh, students, and the institution. And they do an absolutely fabulous job. Can we support them more? And then we have young member panels. And I sat in the young member panel uh, meeting this morning, and I, I'm just so desperately impressed. It's wonderful. The ideas and enthusiasm is just fantastic, and we've got to tap into that. Must. Every one of our regional groups has got to have a very active young member panel. Most do, but not all do, and we've got to change that. <coughs> and we need to continue our support for Workshed. Workshed is an online, um, an online education tool which has been developed entirely altruistically by Expedition Engineering. Uh, I know that Chris Wise is in the room. Um, and it's a completely altruistic thing which they've done. And students all over the world use this. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. And again, I'm so proud to be able to say that this institution um, contributes financially and intellectually to the development and running of, of Workshare, which is fantastic. I believe that every university should be contributing to this, both intellectually and financially, because our students use it. And there'll be countless other things. And so during my year, I want to go out and talk to students and graduates and all members about what else we should be doing to ensure that when students graduate, we are the obvious, the obvious institution, if you're a structural engineer, anywhere in the world to join, because we have that link of creativity and deep education. So responsibilities for various people in the room. In particular, if you're a student member in the room, please join as a STEM ambassador. Go back to your school. Talk about STEAM, by all means. Talk about talk about them, talk about the creative side of what we do. If you are a graduate or professionally qualified member in this room, please knock on the door of your local university. Uh, John Nolan, 2012 president, he knocked on the door of Birmingham University, he's a visiting professor. Nick Russell knocked on the door of the University of Surrey, he's a visiting professor. There. Anybody can knock on the door of local universities. We need your support. Please, please provide that support uh, in tutoring open-ended, and the sorts of design projects I've just been talking about. And the academics in the room, I think there are two things that we must be doing. We need to be going out and telling industry, telling designers about what we do. Our research is interesting. It's good stuff. And there's loads of it going on. I've just sat in the Research Excellence Framework Civil Engineering Panel. I have seen the outcome of structural engineering research in this country. It is fabulous. We need to get that message across. Academics must do this. And I want every academic to put the word creativity into learning outcomes. It's absolutely critical. And the reason is because you look at the structures around us, they are just fabulous. And I believe that we miss this trick, which is that the reason why they're fabulous is because the heart of the profession is creative. And we forget sometimes to make that message loud and clear. And we mustn't forget. Thanks very much.